It is my pleasure today to welcome Senator Mike Lee to the Heritage Foundation. Senator Lee was elected as Utah's 16th Senator in 2010. He earned his Bachelor of Science degree in Political Science from Brigham Young University, where he also served as student body president in his senior year. Following graduation from the BYU Law School, Senator Lee was a law clerk for Judge D. Benson of the U.S. District Court for the District of Utah, and then for the future Supreme Court Justice, Judge Samuel Alito, on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third District. He has served as a practicing attorney specializing in appellate and criminal uh, Supreme Court litigation, an assistant U.S. attorney in Salt Lake City, and as general counsel for former Utah Governor John Huntsman. He is well known as a staunch advocate for and supporter of constitutionally limited government, physical responsibility, individual liberty, and economic prosperity. At Heritage, we'd say there is a think tank mission statement in there someplace. <laughs> His father, Rex Lee, served as Solicitor General under President Reagan, and the Senator was, at an early age, privileged to witness most of his father's oral arguments before the U.S. Supreme Court. Senator Lee is a member of the Judiciary Committee, serves as Chairman of the Antitrust Competition Policy and Consumer Rights Subcommittee, and Chairman of the Water and Power Subcommittee for the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. He also serves on the Armed Services Committee and the Joint Economic Committee. In the 14th Congress, he is now in his tenure as chairman of the Senate Steering Committee. With nothing else on his agenda in the House and the Senate, he has had time to write this wonderful book for us all today, and we look forward to his remarks and exchange of questions with everyone here. Welcome, Senator Lee to Heritage. Thank you. Thank you very much. This book is a lot like Fifty Shades of Grey, um, <laughs> but there are more Constitution scenes in this one uh, than in the other book. I, I, I wrote it so as to make the U.S. Constitution more accessible, more inviting, more interesting, and more applicable in our day-to-day -day conversations, as I think it needs to be. Our Constitution, which is now some 227 years old, has fostered the development of the greatest civilization the world has ever known. And to precisely the degree that we've followed it, we have benefited significantly as a result. There are, however, a number of provisions of the Constitution that have been neglected over the years, some with increasing frequency. Uh, the neglect of these principles has not been neglect that I can lay fairly at the feet of one political party exclusively and not the other. Uh, we have seen both political parties engage in activities that from time to time have undermined the Constitution. Hence the title that I've chosen for this book, Our Lost Constitution. Many of these provisions are lost, in, not in the sense that they're gone forever, because they're not. They're hiding in plain sight. They're still there, they're still part of our document, but for one reason or another, and to one degree or another, they've lost some of their impact, they've lost some of their relevance. But these are provisions that can be resuscitated, they can be restored. What needs to happen in most instances, though, is that the American people need to reincorporate these into our political dialogue, into our political discourse. As I explain in the book, one of the most unfortunate aspects of the way we've treated the Constitution culturally relates to the fact that there is a tendency, especially among those of us who are in politics, to refer to the Constitution as something for the courts. It's a judicial thing. It's a thing for the Supreme Court of the United States. Too often in the United States Senate, for example, when we have a discussion about a particular piece of legislation, a particular government policy, and a constitutional question arises, no sooner has that question been asked than the response is given, well, here's what I think the Supreme Court would do about it. And very often, far too often, an answer that says the Supreme Court's very unlikely to invalidate legislative proposal X if it were to become law is taken as legitimate constitutional analysis, is taken as a definitive word as to the proposal's constitutionality. And that's one central theme in this book that I'd like to point out is that 
there is a big difference between constitutionality and uh, a disinclination on the part of the Supreme Court to intervene and invalidate. Uh, those are not always the same question. Sometimes the court will invalidate a provision because it happens to be unconstitutional. Other times it will decline to do so, but probably should not decline to do so. In other instances, many, many instances, the constitutional question isn't necessarily squarely presented before the court, either before the Supreme Court or any other court. Sometimes it's committed to one of the other branches of government. Sometimes it's uh, something involving an action that by its very nature it isn't as likely to be brought up in the courts. But all of these are reasons why I think we need to reincorporate the Constitution into our discussion. And it needs to become part of our political discourse. Now, I, I grew up in a family where we talked about these things. We talked about them at the dinner table. I've joked before that I was 30 before I realized not every family discusses the presentment clause over dinner. <laughs> and my, my wife and um, my children assured me that I, I would bore the nation silly if I tried to force the constitutional discussion on them by talking only about the constitutional language itself. And little by little, I've, I've learned through trial and error that people are more likely to listen when you fold something into a story, when you invite them into a story so that they can hear and they can understand the background behind uh, a particular provision of the Constitution. So I've, I've gathered a number of stories, stories that are uh, designed to give life to some of our uh, provisions of the Constitution, including some of those that have been neglected. And I've done so in a way that I, I think helps invite the reader in and will, will help invite the American people to re-engage in, in a constitutional discourse as part of our political dialogue in this country. Before we open up the floor to questions, I want, I want to just refer uh, briefly to one or two of these. One of my favorite stories is in the book. Um, it can be found in the chapter where I discuss the Fourth Amendment. And I tell the story of John Wilkes, not to be confused with John Wilkes Booth, Lincoln's assassin. Uh, I tell the story of John Wilkes, uh, the English parliamentarian, who found himself at odds with the administration of King George III from time to time. He started a, a circular um, uh, entitled the North Britain. There were other circulars or weeklies that were printed in England at the time, uh, most of which were sort of in, inclined toward fawning praise of King George III and his administration. Uh, but Wilkes had a different view of how he could contribute uh, to this discussion nationally. And he, his uh, approach was a little more frank. It was a little bit more honest. And it was sometimes not entirely uh, 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 flattering uh, of King George III. He found himself at odds with King George III. He eventually found himself under arrest. And he found himself under multiple circumstances, incarcerated and facing charges. He found his home uh, subject to a search and his papers subject to seizure based on general warrants. Warrants that, contrary to the rights of Englishmen, in effect, under law at the time, didn't specify with particularity the persons, the specific persons or the places to be searched. And he found this very troubling. And as he, uh, as he expressed his viewpoints in these uh, circulars, in these weeklies, known as, as the North Britain, um, he became increasingly subject to scrutiny by King George III. The straw that sort of broke the camel's back was a, a circular entitled uh, number 45. They were numbered, much like the Federalist Papers later were. Number 45 really made King George III mad and landed John Wilkes in even more trouble. But here was the interesting thing. Rather than becoming a pariah in English society, Wilkes soon became a folk hero. Ballads were written about John Wilkes. And number 45, the number 45 itself became uh, a, a popular um, uh, shorthand reference to John Wilkes himself. And there was a period of time in which the, the number 45 could be seen written on the, on the walls of taverns and saloons all over England. And in England and even across the pond in America, the number 45 was synonymous with John Wilkes, which in turn was synonymous 
with the concept of liberty and protection from an omnipresent, brooding, overbearing government that did not respect the rights of individuals. And so th this morning, I, I felt uh, a, a particular uh, a warm feeling in my heart as I checked on how the book was doing. One of the only ways you can check on, on the progress of a book that's just barely been released is you go to Amazon, and you can see where its Amazon's sales ranking is. And I saw this morning that the book was ranked at number 45 on the Amazon bestseller <laughs> list. And I thought, this is Providence smiling upon me. Uh, John Wilkes would be proud. Uh, John Wilkes, in his example, his writings ultimately influenced uh, what became a very important part of our Constitution, the Fourth Amendment, which is one of the provisions that I outline in this book as a provision that's been weakened in recent years by a brooding, omnipresent government that isn't always as inclined to respect our privacy as it should. Uh, as examples of this, I point to the fact that under the Electronic Communications Privacy Act of 1986, the federal government technically has, or at least claims, the power to read your email without a warrant as long as that email is older than 180 days old. Now, it's kind of disturbing. It's not something that any one of us would think was consistent with the concept of ordered liberty, certainly not with the concept of uh, uh, privacy protected by the Fourth Amendment. And yet this remains under U.S. law as a remnant from this law passed in 1986. Uh, whenever I raise this subject, I ask people, what were you doing in 1986? Uh, I was in the ninth grade. Um, I didn't have email. In fact, I had never heard of email. My family didn't own a computer. If we had owned a computer at the time, chances are it would have been something like the Commodore VIC-20, um, uh, which, which I, and I think the 20 referred to the fact that its processing power was limited to 20 kilobytes or something like that. Uh, not exactly a... Um, uh, a, a powerhouse of a machine, but this law was passed at a time when people didn't realize what was going to happen uh, with computers, that people would be communicating routinely through computers. They didn't realize what would happen through email. So this is an example of how legislatively we have to sometimes catch our law up to the Constitution to make sure it matches. I've also raised concerns in the book about some of the things that the NSA is doing relative to the collection of metadata, uh, relative to the fact that the NSA collects data on your cell phone, and uh, I'm referring to every individual in this room. The NSA has data regarding who you have called and who has called you at what time and for how long over the last five years. That database is searchable. That data, when aggregated and searched, tells all kinds of things about you. According to some researchers, some graduate research students at uh, Stanford University in the last year or so, um, that data can reveal all kinds of things about you, including uh, your political affiliation, how politically active you are, your r religious affiliation, what church you belong to, um, uh, y the condition of your health, how often you visit the doctor, what ailments you might suffer from, and all kinds of other things that are, quite frankly, none of the government's business. It is one thing to collect this information relative to persons outside the United States, to non-U.S. citizens and or people outside of our borders. It is quite another thing to gather that kind of data as a matter of course on every single American citizen inside of our country simply because they exist and breathe here on our soil. This is yet another example of how the Fourth Amendment and other aspects of the Constitution need to be brought up routinely as part of our political discourse and one of the reasons why I wrote this book. But with that, let's open up the floor to questions and let's talk about whatever is on your mind and um, Let's see how how do we how do we do this? Play, we'll, well, I'll I'll embarrass them instead okay. of you, okay. and then we'll ask that it's a question, as in Jeopardy, not a statement. That means that right? my answer has to be in the form no, of a no, question. Well, that works. <laughs> if you're avoiding the answer, yeah. yes. And if I pause, you're going to start humming the theme to Jeopardy, I'm sure. And I need to find where my there it is. My question for you, Senator Lee, regards just the question of general supremacy overall. Um, whether you think that Supreme Court decisions should be bound toward the participants directly in the case uh, before the court, because oftentimes it seems the court's decisions are sweeping, but even consistent with the logic of Federalist 78, as well as the original interpretation of Marbury v. Madison and how it was understood by John Marshall, do you think we should limit cases in that way? 
Okay, good question. So the judgment issued by the court in any particular case uh, uh, binds the parties before the court. It, 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 it doesn't, um, uh, the best way to understand it is that it doesn't bind others, it binds the parties before the court. Now, it does create precedent, precedent that other courts uh, follow, and precedent that the Supreme Court itself uh, may follow, will likely follow under the doctrine of stare decisis. But literally speaking, the judgment issued in a particular case binds the parties before the court and not others. I have one down here, Ben, and then we'll go back to Jack Moore to lawyer. Good morning. <clears throat> Sorry, good morning, Senator. Uh, Nate Madden with Conservative Review. I'm curious, uh, a couple of brief questions about your chapter on the Fourth Amendment. Um, first off, when, in discussing the metadata collection, I was at a briefing yesterday where Patrick Eddington of the Cato Institute argued not only that metadata collection is bad for civil liberty, it's also highly ineffective, citing Hayek's knowledge problem. Um, would you agree with uh, Mr. Eddington in saying that probably a better approach to balancing privacy and security is a, is a return to human intelligence? <laughs> okay. Um, on the, did you want to ask the second question, too, and you want me to answer both of them? With um, and the second one, I noticed that, uh, yes, on the John Wilkes story and a couple of others, especially on the Second Amendment, one, Second Amendment you chose to cite a, several uh, stories from the U.K., and I was at a speaking event of yours in uh, November 2013 in London. And I was wondering, uh, did that sort of, is that sort of conversation that you've had with uh, the British Conservative Party influence your selection of stories in this book? Okay, so let me answer the second one first, and then I'll get back to the first one. Uh, as to the second question, no. Uh, that was influenced simply by the fact that I wanted to draw a connection uh, between events that happened, uh, uh, many events that happened prior to the revolution, and explain how they influenced events on the other side of the pond. Uh, we, we, we drew, we created our legal system basically on uh, the chassis of the English legal system. And the experience that we had as uh, British subjects in colonial America um, caused us to be influenced by those same legal developments. So the things that were happening with John Wilkes, for example, had a, a strong influence on this side of the pond. That's really what uh, uh, caused me to um, uh, focus on that. On the first question, um, I'm not sure that I'm the best one to assess the bulk metadata collection program used by the NSA on the basis of its efficacy. I'm not sure I'm the best one to talk about, to criticize it based on its efficacy, in part because my concern has nothing to do with its efficacy. My concern is that e even, even if you do find this very, very effective, there's still something a little problematic about pulling personal data and uh, amassing that personal data, holding it there so that it can be searched and readily accessed, uh, at, readily accessed at, at any given time without any showing of any connection by any U.S. citizen to some kind of unlawful activity or some kind of activity that might threaten the national security of the United States of America. Well, I don't, I don't want to say that the, the effectiveness of the program is irrelevant, but that's not my primary focus. And the, the fact that it, it may not be that effective, um, if, if that's true, uh, that perhaps adds to this discussion. And I, I, uh, I'm going to have to look up those remarks. I, I'd love to find out more about that. Uh, here in the middle, yeah, and then we'll go back. I need to get your mic to you. Yeah. Milton Grenthal, American citizen. I also want to mention that that megadata can, uh, could be leaked to, say, the IRS, which has been known to happen. Um, I wanted to ask you about the Interstate Commerce Clause which I think has been now so loosely interpreted, <laughs> at least since Roosevelt, that, it, that it has led to all sorts of mischief. Uh, your general thoughts about it, what can be done to kind of pare that back? Okay, great, great question. I talk about this a fair amount in the book um, in connection with my discussion of the Tenth Amendment. The Tenth Amendment is one of the parts of the Constitution that I identify as part of our lost Constitution. The reason I say it's lost is for this simple reason. In a sense, the powers delegated to Congress and, and, and the things that are um, covered by the Tenth Amendment and reserved to the states under the Tenth Amendment, they are two sides of the same coin. You, you can't really evaluate one without also evaluating the other. 
I, I was initially bothered in law school when I, I uh, read the footnote dropped by Justice Stone about the Tenth Amendment representing but a truism, a truism that, <laughs> that uh, all is retained by the states, which isn't uh, given over to the federal government and the Constitution. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized he's got a point. He, he's, he's saying something valid there in that if you interpret the... Uh, powers given to Congress, either under Article I, Section 8, where most of the powers are found, or, or elsewhere, if you view any one of those powers, or all those powers aggregated together, as giving unlimited authority to Congress, then there is nothing left of the Tenth Amendment. There is nothing left to the states, nothing but the, uh, uh, the, the judgment and, and will of Congress uh, to preserve something as exclusively the domain of states and local governments. So the, the text of the Tenth Amendment says that all powers not granted to Congress and, and not prohibited to the states shall be reserved to the states, respectively, or, or to the people. And so you really can't see one without the other. So that's, that, that's where this discussion of the Commerce Clause comes in. So, and, and the beef I have with modern interpretation of the Commerce Clause is that it leaves almost nothing. We had... In the early 1930s, a big push by the FDR administration to create all kinds of new government programs. I talk about uh, one of them, the National uh, 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 Recovery Administration and the, and the legislation that, um, that put that together. And I explained that that program was invalidated by the Supreme Court, along with a number of other programs uh, that were part of the New Deal. FDR grew very frustrated with the court on this, and so FDR started pushing back. And in, in March of 1937, uh, he issued his big threat to the court, his court packing plan. He was going to be able to add under that plan as many as five new uh, 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 FDR nominees to that court because he said for every justice who remains on the court after the age of 70 and chooses not to retire beyond that point, I, FDR, whoever the president is at that time, will have the opportunity to nominate at least one more justice. Now, it's important to remember the timing of this. The Supreme Court had moved into its new marble palace almost exactly two years earlier, on April 12, 1935. Up until that point, uh, the, the judiciary had been sort of the neglected uh, uh, child within the federal government. It was not really... Uh, perceived as being a fully coordinate branch of government, in part because it didn't have its own building. And then it got the mother of all buildings. I mean, this thing, the, the Taj Mahal, it's absolutely beautiful. It's a work of art. They loved their new digs. And, and I think they were especially offended by this thought that um, the president could almost, uh, could, could almost single-handedly change the complexion of the court just like that, just by pushing legislation through the court. And so I explained that that may well have had some impact on the decision issued on April 12th, 1937, exactly two years to the date that they had moved into that building, in a case called NLRB versus Jones and Laughlin Steel Company. Now, this was a big day in American history, because on this day, the Constitution was amended. It was changed. It was, it, it was amended not through the uh, amendment process uh, through either of the amendment processes outlined in Article 5. It was just amended by the Supreme Court. It was, it was one of the most significant amendments ever made. The Supreme Court started interpreting the Commerce Clause so broadly that it can mean just about anything. It's where uh, the court laid the seeds for what later became the standard that has lasted now for nearly 80 years under the Commerce Clause, the standard of review that sort of uh, uh, was perfected in uh, Wickard v. Filburn, a case decided five years later. That, that of course, is the case involving Roscoe Filburn, this, this um, uh, poor wheat farmer who committed this grave offense against the United States. He grew too much wheat. <laughs> and he said, my wheat, the wheat I grew in excess of the national wheat uh, uh, limits established in Washington, um, it's not subject to federal control because the wheat I grew in excess of the quota uh, never entered interstate commerce. In fact, it never entered commerce at all. Uh, I, I, it never left my farm. I, I used it, uh, I held onto it as seed for the next season and to feed my family and my livestock. And so that was sort of the high watermark or the low watermark, depending on how you want to look at it, 
um, for Commerce Clause jurisprudence, we've never retreated from it. We've never gone away from it. And, 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 and so since 1937, um, even though the facts of NLRB versus Jones and Laughlin Steel are less interesting, and the standard of review was less uh, distilled in 1937 than it later would be in 1942 with Wickard v. Filburn, that was the moment that changed everything. Because from that moment forward, anything that could be said in the aggregate to have a substantial effect on interstate commerce was itself subject to federal control. And as I explain in the book, up until that time, uh, from, from the time of the founding up until then, it had always been understood that there were all kinds of things that involved economic activity or that affected interstate commerce that were not subject to federal control. Things that occur in one state at one time, like labor, manufacturing, agriculture, mining, particularly things that occur outside of any channel or instrumentality of interstate commerce, meaning um, interstate airways, airwaves, waterways, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> those things were subject to local control and not federal control. Uh, it, it frustrates me that, that, that the court and many legal scholars will defend this by saying, well, you know, the founding generation, at the time of the founding, we, we had an agrarian society, as, as if that makes them somehow um, incompetent to, to assess these things. The fact that they uh, grew their own food and, and used a horse and buggy as their most sophisticated mode of transport doesn't mean they didn't understand that uh, economic activity in one state affects economic activities elsewhere. It would be wonderful if we could cross-examine one of the founding fathers here today and ask them a question. Do, do you understand that um, the sale of tobacco in Virginia has an effect on the economy in uh, South Carolina and in North Carolina and elsewhere in, 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 in the republic? They absolutely would have acknowledged that, that it did. But once we changed our understanding of it, the Commerce Clause ceased to have any real limits on it. And as I explained in the book, there have been only three occasions since 1937 when the Supreme Court has identified something Congress has done that falls outside of its Commerce Clause authority. Everywhere else, the Supreme Court has basically uh, uh, had a perpetually green light. You had once in Lopez, uh, the United States versus Lopez in 1995 when the court invalidated aspects of the Gun-Free School Zones Act, saying that bare intrastate possession uh, not relating to any commercial activity within a state, within a school zone, isn't within the reach of the Commerce Clause. In 2000, in, in United States versus Morrison, the, uh, the court reached a similar pr conclusion with respect to some aspects of the Violence Against Women Act. And then again, of course, in um, uh, uh, June of 2012, when the court issued its decision, NFIB versus Sebelius, uh, the court nominally concluded that the individual mandate in Obamacare was outside of the Supreme uh, of Congress's Commerce Clause authority, uh, but then, as I explain in the book, and the court then goes on to paper over that by rewriting the statute, rewriting the Constitution, and calling that a valid exercise of Congress's power to tax. So my point is this: uh, the Tenth Amendment has perhaps been the the biggest victim of of, of all of this, of the expansive reading of the Commerce Clause. Um, now, I, I, I'm sure that a, as I release this book and as I utter these words, there are lots of people out there just jumping at the book saying, oh, Mr. Lee would take us back to the era of the horse and buggy and the agrarian society. That is absolute nonsense. Technology changes. Sure, the Founding Fathers could never have envisioned the, um, uh, the, the, the power or the need to have the power to regulate interstate airways or airwaves or, or things that they didn't envision. But those are channels and instrumentalities of interstate commerce. There is a way to interpret the Commerce Clause that doesn't render every other portion of the enumerated powers doctrine, and with it, the Tenth Amendment, entirely irrelevant, entirely a nullity. And that's basically what we have today. Other than that, I don't have an opinion on the Commerce Clause. <laughs> Gentleman in the back, and then we'll come up here in the middle. Uh, coming back to the national security issues, in light of the Sarnayev trial, and the number of people that the FBI has just recently, within the last couple of weeks, arrested, I believe, in New Jersey, and the police in Barcelona arresting a couple of dozen ISIS terrorists, and what happened in France yesterday with their whole internet was shut down by ISIS, 
and that could, they can do it in France, they can do it here. Is it really reasonable to be so concerned about the NSA collecting all that metadata? Because if you wait to get a search warrant after the fact, it's already too late, and you couldn't possibly get a. You need some way of finding out who in a foreign country is talking to somebody here, and therefore vice versa, in order to find these terrorists before they blow something up. Is it really necessary to be as concerned as you and uh, Senator Paul uh, seem to be about the NSA's collection of metadata, or for that matter, the cell phone information? Okay, uh, uh, very, uh, uh, very good question. Look, I'm, I'm never going to stand here and say it's not important to be concerned about our national security, but for the same reasons that I will never say that, I will also never say that because there are threats to our national security, the Fourth Amendment isn't worth preserving with our policies. Uh, I, I, I reject the premise that uh, many have suggested we ought to indulge, which is that our privacy and our security are irreconcilably in conflict with each other. I, I happen to believe that our privacy is part of our security. It's inextricably intertwined with our privacy. Uh, our Fourth Amendment jurisprudence is, is um, uh, not overly simplistic. And in fact, it, it has allowed us to develop a number of doctrines that allow us to deal with a lot of exigent circumstances um, uh, wh where public safety is concerned so that it's not excessively rigid. It's, it's not excessively, um, it, it's not something that amounts to a suicide pact. A and I, I actually think we can still honor it. Um, th and the examples that you pointed to um, involve something other than the need to collect bulk metadata from 300 million Americans regardless of whether they're talking to anyone outside the United States, regardless of whether they're traveling outside the United States, and regardless of whether they have any connection to anyone who is suspected in doing something that could harm us. Here in the middle, back row. Yeah. Hi, Paul Kaminar, uh, co-counsel with Congressman Trent Franks and some 50 congressmen in the challenge to Obamacare under the origination clause, which you discuss in Chapter 2, uh, Senator Cruz and Corn and filed an amicus brief in the Fifth Circuit in 20 states, including Utah. Uh, so what I'd like to get your reaction is uh, your chapter two about the origination clause, how important that is, and what you think would uh, uh, predict what the Supreme Court might rule in this case, which is uh, pending in the Fifth Circuit. Great question. Yeah, and as you point out, I, I, I devote uh, an entire chapter to the origination clause. The origination clause is especially important, and I identify it as something that that really, um, really saved the Constitution. Without the compromise that is embodied and, and that culminated in the origination clause, I don't think the convention would have ever produced the Constitution. Uh, the, the, the conflict between the large states and the small states was simply too deep and entrenched and with good reason ever to have survived uh, but for that compromise. And had we had we given effect to that compromise more consistently in Congress, uh, and, and had that been recognized in 2010, at the time of the uh, passage of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, uh, there would not have been Obamacare. And the American people who have found their health care becoming less affordable and less accessible uh, as a result of that law would have been protected from it. As to the likelihood of the Supreme Court uh, ruling in your favor in that case, um, I don't know that I can assess that well yet. I, 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 when do you expect, have you had argument, is it under advisement before the, the Fifth uh, Circuit? argument uh, was argued in December in the uh, Fifth Circuit. There was a parallel case in the D.C. Circuit that already ruled uh, against the parties on the grounds that Obamacare is not even raising any revenue, it's not a bill for raising revenue, and you saw the street said it was a bill for improving health care, even though you point out it raises $500 billion in revenue. So and even though the Supreme Court itself <laughs> affirmed it as a valid exercise of the taxing power. Yeah, Yeah. so the, the, the Fifth Circuit is pending uh, for a decision. The D.C. Circuit is a petition for rehearing on bonk. 
pending there as well. And, but your post-argument in the Fifth Circuit, uh, yeah. you've already argued? Yes, we're waiting for a decision. By the way, who is your panel? Uh, That's okay. That's okay if you don't sorry. remember. I'm just curious. Uh, okay. okay, so if, especially if you get a ruling uh, in your favor in the Fifth Circuit, that would seem to present a, a rather delicious, appealing <laughs> split. Uh, you'll be teed up perfectly in front of the Supreme Court. Um, and uh, I look forward to reading that. It's, it's really hard for me to, to handicap something before cert has even been granted. I, 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 I tried to avoid um, uh, uh, publicly predicting which way the court's going to rule, uh, but I never attempted until cert is granted and at least the briefs have been submitted. Um, uh, by the way, one, one of the strongest predictions I ever made, I, I, I've gotten pretty good over the years at predicting them. But I was dead wrong in NFIB versus Sibelius. I, I sat there on the edge of my seat for, what, five, six hours of argument in that case and uh, loved every minute of it, watched every twitch, every gesture, for, particularly from John Roberts and Anthony Kennedy. And I was absolutely convinced the court was going to invalidate it. And um, I was right at the time I made that prediction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bailey will take to our whichever Todd, it's on the other side of here. Thank you. Todd Gaziano from the Pacific Legal Foundation. And I want to ask you about a, a different um, a clause of the, or area of the Constitution where the Supreme Court has abdicated. But I first do want to thank you and mention that it's the Pacific Legal Foundation that brought the origination clause in the DC Circuit, CISL, and we've been waiting six months for a rehearing petition. I think it's, there's maybe a dissent from denial, and, and if, he, if the other Fifth Circuit case wins, we're, we're, our case is the one that's gonna go to the Supreme Court, because we'll have the cert <laughs> petition. But anyway, I wanna thank you. you Settle this over an arm yeah. wrestle. But, but I wanna thank, <laughs> I wanna th oh, and we're gonna win. Yeah. If, if the good, Supreme good. Court good. takes the case, there's no way we can lose with, with the origination clause surviving, and I don't think John Roberts is going to do that. I assume, by the way, the, the, the most likely point, uh, if you, if it, if, assuming the court takes it, and it, if you were to lose, the most likely way you would lose it would be if they said, well, according to the, the rules of the House of Representatives, uh, this did originate in the House, and that's the end of the discussion. That, is that, that, is even that, the panel decision, which was a two Obama and one Clinton panel, the D.C. Circuit didn't accept that argument. They, they misread some 19th century Supreme Court opinions, which has really been clarified. Anyway, well, okay, sorry, it clarified I, I interrupted. in the 1990s. But anyway, I'll, I'll be glad to meet with you or your staff about, about that uh, at any that. time. But we also uh, thank you for, uh, I can't wait to read your book and your support of our, our challenge on, on uh, the Utah Prairie Dogs. We look forward to working with you on that case on, on enumerated powers. But my question results to the, 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 the about five clauses of the Constitution that were thrown overboard in the administrative state. Philip, Professor Philip Hamburger wrote a great book, uh, talked about violations. This is the one that's called is Administrative Law Unconstitutional? Is Administrative yeah. Law Unlawful? And he answers yes. Um, <laughs> it violates you know due process, Fourth Amendment rights for binding uh, uh, searches and, and, and seizures without court or um, uh, 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 violates uh, uh, the, the protection against self-incrimination because they make you re report and self-incriminate yourself. Um, but also, you know, the, the unconstitutional delegations. Uh, 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 Justice um, Thomas, in his concurrence in the Amtrak case a few weeks ago, I'm sure you saw, you know, wants to re-raise the, the improper standard for legislative delegations. Um, but I don't think he has maybe more than one other vote, may possibly Alito, without some members of Congress speaking out about the outrageous delegations that allow the president with the pen and the phone to do you know, whatever he wants through his... Is there any... Um, what, what opportunities do you see to, to raise some issues against the administrative state? Maybe you've addressed some of them in your book. I don't, I don't know yet. But, 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 but what, what can you all do to to kind of make it more acceptable for judges and justices like Thomas to reconsider some of those horrible administrative state rulings? I'm so glad you asked this question. Th th this, this is um, one of the very most important parts of my book, and I, I do cover this at some length. And, and I talk about this issue almost every time I speak anywhere. Let, let me start by explaining how I introduced this topic in my book. I refer to 
two stacks of documents that I keep in my office in the Senate. Um, every, every Wednesday at 3.30, we uh, hold a, um, we serve Jello in my office whenever the Senate's in session. It's a, we call it Jello Wednesday. You're free to stop by anytime. It's Utah's official state snack for reasons that I've never entirely understood. But every Wednesday at 3.30, we serve Jello. Anyway, when you come in for Jello Wednesday, you'll see these two stacks of documents I keep in my office. The first stack is 11 feet tall. It consists of last year's Federal Register. The Federal Register, for uh, those of you who uh, don't recall, is the annual cumulative index of federal regulations as they're released for notice and comment initially and later as they're finalized and so forth. 80,000 pages long last year, 11 feet tall. The other stack, just a few inches tall. It's the laws passed by Congress last year, just a few hundred pages long. 80,000 to just a few hundred, 11 feet to just a few inches. So those regulations bind the American people. And in fact, the, uh, according to most estimates, the modern administrative regulatory state costs the American economy $2 trillion a year. Now, when I was in law school, we had a guest speaker that came, uh, a, a, a guy who now serves on the US Court of Federal Claims, um, Lawrence Block, uh, was then working on the Hill. and he. He, he, uh, his remarks deeply troubled me when he, he explained the, the federal regulatory uh, uh, state was costing the American economy $300 billion a year. And he explained that this is a sort of backdoor tax, an invisible backdoor tax most Americans don't see, but that it affects everyone. People think that these regulatory compliance costs are borne by the wealthy only and by big corporations only. Well, not at all. The, all of those costs are passed downstream. They make everything we buy more expensive, and they disproportionately affect poor and middle class Americans. Um, and so this is not a victimless violation of the Constitution. We've delegated so much of our power, um, and Congress itself has created the problem. And by the way, this is part of the reason why I tell the story at the outset of uh, Alexander Hamilton advocating for a monarchy at the beginning of the book. He openly advocated for a monarchy. It tanked his political career. And he and the other founders would be shocked today to see how much of our law is, is made by men and women who, well-educated, well-intentioned, highly specialized, and hardworking as they may be, don't work for the people. They're not accountable to anyone who does work for the people. You can't fire them in two-year and six-year increments like you can congressmen and senators. Uh, it is a huge problem, and it's one that Congress has caused. One thing I think the Founding Fathers didn't anticipate, and it's reasonable they didn't anticipate this, they thought that we would have every incentive in the book to, to jealously guard our own power, which really belongs to the people and not to us, but to guard it. He didn't see that in time there would be an overwhelming temptation to pass these really broad general laws th that allow us to take credit for the good goals and objectives these things have while avoiding all the criticism that goes along with the difficult line drawing uh, that has to be done whenever you make laws. It is as though we have said the following, we hereby pass this law called the law to have good laws, and we hereby declare as a Congress, we shall have good law. We hereby delegate to the herewith created Federal Commission on Good Laws the task of making good law. Make it so. The Commission of Good Laws then makes law, all of the law. We're not accountable for any of it. And whenever something good happens, we say, yeah, we did that. I voted for good law. When something bad happens, we say, ah, those barbarians at the Commission on Good Law. <laughs> well, this, I don't have to, because this is what we've done. There is only one distinction between that hypothetical, which is not much of a hypothetical, and where we are now. And that is that we've broken it up into lots of increments. And, and, and we've done it by category, and we've given it to highly specialized agencies. That's the only distinction. But that is a distinction, constitutionally speaking, that's largely without a difference. So mostly by informing people about it, uh, I, I think we can move forward a real solution. Uh, I would love it if the courts were to join in this effort to restore the legislative branch to its position of, uh, uh, of accountability, where it needs to be. In the meantime, I've got to do everything I can within the legislative branch to bring about legislative changes. The best thing we can do there is pass the RAINS Act. The RAINS Act, which says that at least for all new major rules, 
No major rule may take effect without Congress affirmatively enacting it into law and the president signing it into law. This is always as it should have been. This is always as it was. By the way, 30 more seconds, and then we'll go on to the next question. I, but I, if you really want to geek out on this issue, give some <laughs> thought sometime. INSV Chada. So INSV Chada said that the legislative veto was unconstitutional, that it violates the presentment clause because Congress rang the bell by giving authority to the executive branch, but said we have the ability to unring the bell if we don't like what the executive branch agency does. If that violates the presentment clause because it's not subject to a, a, a subsequent uh, signature or veto by the president, then doesn't it also violate the same principles to give the creation to, to the, the, the power to create the law ab initio to an executive branch agency without that having to go through the presentment process as well from Congress to the president of the United States? I actually think there is a legal doctrinal way to get there with the court, but the right arguments have to be made. And we need parallel tracks to also pursue the Reins Act. Let's do one more and lady in the very back corner. Finally get to the far side of the room. Good afternoon, Senator. I have a question. Um, I certainly don't mind standing up for our founding fathers for this sacred document that they founded to protect the American people. And with that being said, I'd like to know and have clarification on this Iran quote unquote deal. Is this deal a treaty? And if so, does this treaty have any, has an association with Article 2 that cannot be abused or should not be abused? Okay, a great question. Um, all of this is going to turn back on what the definition of the word it is. <laughs> um, so we don't yet have an it. We don't know what it is. We keep hearing about it. We hear uh, the White House talking about the pursuit of it. But there is no it. Uh, we have deadline after deadline that it comes and goes, and we've told, oh, it's coming. We don't know what the it is. If the it purports to be and would operate as um, an ongoing mutual set of obligations between two or more countries, then that starts sounding awful like awful lot like a treaty. If, if, if it walks like a treaty and quacks like a treaty, uh, uh, you know the rest. Uh, it, it, and if that's the case, then that would require ratification by the Senate, uh, which is not a simple majority vote. It requires a two-thirds supermajority uh, in order for it to be effective. If, on the other hand, the it um, is simply a, a, an understanding between this administration, this president, and uh, somebody else, the effect that he's got a certain number of um, tools at his disposal under existing U.S. law and a certain amount of discretion uh, as to how to utilize that law, when and where to invoke it. Uh, and, and he's saying between now and the time that I'm no longer president, here's how I intend to exercise that discretion. That sounds rather less like a treaty and, and would, would not necessarily require ratification. So I'm still waiting to see what the it is, and perhaps more importantly, whether there is an it at all. And frankly, at this point, I'm doubtful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you. So was this what, like, dinner table was at your house? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Nice less enough. applause, though. L less applause. <laughs> Uh, I do want to say before we adjourn that I know Senator DeMint would have liked to have been here, the president of the Heritage Foundation. Unfortunately, we previously have him in California for one of those duties that requires money to be raised for the organization to keep existing. So, uh, But I do pass on his good welcome to Heritage. Uh, we would um, again remind everyone we have copies available in the foyer, and I'm going to ask the senator if you'll use this side closer to the flag for the few people that want pictures for signing here at the front. Otherwise, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much.